All right, thanks for having me here, and it's a, it's a really interesting meeting. And so I worked with uh, Jackson Lab to uh, establish uh, and improve the technology of using CRISPR to make mouse model. And my main lab actually is in uh, Institute of Zoology, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. Uh, in there, we focus on making large animal models as well as uh, therapeutic applications. So when we think about precision medicine or, or the topic of this conference, I think it's really we want to know is by looking at the genomic sequence of the, of the different patients, we can identify the genetic variants that, that have something to do with the disease development. Therefore, we can develop therapeutics for them specifically. Um, and another layer of complexity is, is the epigenetic modification so, and the misregulation of the genes. So for those two layers, we need better technologies to model them. Uh, in the organism or in different assays. So genome editing obviously is a very powerful tool, and those are the major um, tools, and CRISPR-Cas obviously is the most uh, powerful one. So what they do is basically you can design those protein to bind to very specific locus in the genome and make a double strand break that can be repaired by different repair pathway that result in an allele or you can put in pretty fun mutation there. And uh, uh, the reason CRISPR is so powerful is, is different from the other two. You don't have to design a new protein for each locus. You just design, a, express a small RNA that, based on the base pairing of the RNA and the target DNA, you can guide the Cas9 that uh, go to any place to make the, the gene modification. So decades of work really accumulated to this, um, this landmark paper that demonstrated um, you can basically express those two RNA that recognizing any DNA, base, uh, DNA template and generate this double strand break precisely. Um, and followed quickly by those two papers showing optimization of the system can be uh, useful in the mammalian cells. And what we did then is to show you can, uh, in the mouse embryo stem cells, you can simultaneously knock out five genes with a very high efficiency, and uh, that kind of useful for making mouse, uh, uh, cell line models. Also, by introducing the system into zygote, uh, the, the enzymes start to add the genome in the very early embryos, Therefore, you generated a mouse with the mutant in one generation, and you can actually do this by now calling multiple genes at one step, as well as putting in multiple specific point mutations to different genes in one step. I want to point you to this supplemental data, actually, uh, which is we tried to now call TET3, and the knocking, uh, the, the genome editing is very efficient, so this band is a mutant band. This is a wild type, so you can see all the embryos are kind of mutated. And we already see the phenotype in F0 animals. So when, when you inject them the day one, in day uh, 21, you see those pups showing the neonatal lethality phenotype. So that means you can actually use this approach to screen a large number of genes to, to see their phenotype with a very small number of um, uh, animals in a very short amount of time. And in the following study, we showed by introducing different type of DNA template, you can repair uh, the break by introducing uh, epitope tags or uh, reporter genes as well as LOX P sites. So with all that set up, the system is comparing to traditional gene targeting ma making mouse model. The cost is dramatically reduced, and more importantly, the time you saved is most, most significant, and also it's very flexible. You can theoretically work on any strain you want without having to do this first in the good mRNA stem cell strain and then strain migrate them. So still, um, the one bottleneck of this uh, whole procedure that does not allow high throughput is really the macroinjection process. You need a very expensive setup and also very, uh, the most, I think most limiting factor is really to find a very good macroinjectionist can do this very, very efficiently and, and, and consistently. So to, to solve this issue, we developed this zygote electrician of nuclease technology. So basically, we treat the embryos as any other cells we electrate in the, in the labs. We just put in them into a cuvette, electrate them in the, in the commercially available electrator, and that allows you to, uh, to deliver the CRISPR region uniformly to hundreds of embryos in the same cuvette simultaneously. And after optimization, you can, this is one example, actually is one of the rather difficult locus we are targeting. So here we are introducing uh, two restriction sites to this uh, 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 locus, and so if it's targeted correctly with a precise point mutation, you would digested this PCR product with both and uh, either enzymes. So that's exactly what you'll see. So you can actually achieve a, a, a really 80 and 90 percent of efficiency to guiding your funder animal by just select breeding them. So with that, uh, I think we are really uh, now can do this with a high throughput manner. You have one technician knows how to handle embryos. 
they can quickly go through 20, 30, 50 uh, projects in one, you know, you know, you know, in, in one day, uh, and then you can, you can just transfer them and do, uh, do your phenotyping. Um, so I think with those, um, we can quickly screen candidate genes in founder animals that uh, either it's from multiple genes in the GWAS hit or it's uh, uh, many new genes you found from exome sequencing. And also you can generate a human genetic variant in the mouse author log uh, by using a single oligo as a template uh, by elaboration. So in addition to genome editing making mouse models, um, I, I think the, CRISP, the Cas9 is also extremely versatile per, uh, protein. You basically they have two independent nucleus domains, so if you mutate either one of them, it becomes a knee case, that only nicking one strand of the, of the DNA. And if you mutate both of them, they become a, a reprogrammable uh, a DNA binding protein. They can guide it by RNA and binding anywhere you want, uh, but doesn't cut. So by doing that, you can actually fuse a protein that have any function to, to do a, a very specific, uh, uh, almost anything to anywhere in the genome. So, um, we basically develop a system called CRISPR-on, so basically that's a very simple idea. You, you basically make, uh, fuse your DCAS9 with a very strong activator. This is a 10 copy of the VP16, and we show that you can actually bind to a specific promoter and, and activate the endogenous gene very efficiently, and you can activate three endogenous genes simultaneously. You can also control the ratio of their activation by controlling the amount of RNA you're expressing. And also, we showed if you introduce a system into one cell zygote, you can actually turn on the reporter you co-injected in the early embryo. So you can do this potentially in vivo. But the system is still not um, perfect if you think about a complex disease or a complex transcription network. Because if now I want to activate certain genes and, and, and repress certain genes, you cannot really do this in the same cells. Because if you co-express those uh, uh, effectors, they don't know which gene they're gonna repress and which gene they're gonna activate. So you have to have a, a mechanism to, to do this in a multiplex way. So what we, uh, the solution we uh, thought of is this combination of this Cas9 protein and uh, a Pamilio protein. So this protein is really interesting. It's an RNA binding protein. So it's like a tail, if you're familiar with the tailing technology. It's like a tail. So they have this repetitive domain, each domain recognizing one nucleotide of the, of the RNA. So now you can do is you can engineer this domain to recognize the specific A base pair of the RNA. Now you can have this RNA, A base pair binding, uh, uh, binding sites linked to the end of the guide RNA. So now you have a molecule that have the, so, okay, so the specific binding sites will recruit a specific flavor of this puff protein uh, fused with a specific effector. So then with this single RNA molecule, you combine the information of their function and their target on the same molecule. So now you can do this with multiplexed uh, uh, manipulation. So the first thing we tried is by just simply adding up to 47 copy of the binding sites, eight base pair binding sites, that doesn't interfere with the CRISPR system. So this is not, uh, not fused and those are fused with different copy number. They uh, perform equally uh, well. And then the real experiment is we express the system uh, together with different flavor, different puff protein, and fused with the VP64. And we express, say, the puff A with four different, with the guide RNA fused with four different binding sites. And they only activate when you express the guide RNA that have the puff A binding sites. So that means, and doesn't activate in other uh, sequences. That means the system is very specific and they can work independently with each other. So we showed go ahead and this system can be uh, uh, used to activate endogenous gene and because we are now recruiting many copy of the factor, not just one copy by direct fusion, you can activate the genes much more efficiently. So this is a, this is a Casilio activation, this is direct fusion activation. So this is in OX4 and SOX2. And more importantly, the, the, the experiments to show you can simultaneously activating one gene and downregulating the other gene. Uh, so that's basically prove the concept that you can actually have this information. The PAF A was recruited to the, uh, the gene they want to activate because the PAF A fused with the activator and the PAF C, I think, or W, whatever, uh, are recruited to the gene they want to repress and with the, uh, the PAF B protein fused with the repressor. And more than uh, activating the promoter, we showed you can, the system can recruiting 
uh, histone modifier into the enhancer, and therefore uh, manipulating the gene expression uh, from binding to the enhancer and modify the histone uh, acetyl, uh, uh, acetylation. So here we showed you can use the casio system to binding to the enhancer of the OCT4, and that actually interestingly activating the gene more efficiently than the direct fusion of the DCAS9 and the uh, histone acetyl transferase uh, fusion. And one last thing is really, I think it's very interesting to uh, study the chromosome structure because that's another layer of, of epigenetic uh, uh, regulation. And here we show, because you can recruit many protein to the one locus, you can get better signal to noise when you label a specific uh, genomic locus. Uh, so uh, we show that when you use more copy number of the binding sites, you get a better labeling of the telomere uh, when you use the GFP to label it. And there's a quantification showing when we use more copies, you get more uh, signal to noise and also the, a better number of foci being identified that's closer to you would predict. And by co-staining, we show the labeling is specific. It's co-localized with the uh, telomere associated protein. And the same thing can be shown for uh, uh, labeling centromere. Uh, and obviously, the system can work simultaneously, so you can co-label two genomic loci with two different colors simultaneously. And uh, because this oligomerization feature, we can now uh, use a much uh, small number of guide RNA to label unique uh, sequence. I think that's a goal. And we do observe um, a, a very nice labeling of, of unique sequences, uh, but they still need to be fine-tuned to, to, to really work well. So with this platform, I think it's very versatile. You can use this to do multiplex function and, and directly multiple gene. You can uh, recruit multiple protein to a specific locus, do labeling or do other function. And the other thing we want to explore is to really use this to recruit a complex that can work in a synergetic way. So with that, I think we can potentially in the future to model epigenetic uh, abnormality as well as uh, gene regulation networks. So one last thing I want to um, I want to uh, raise just it's a it's a question really uh, because we think about from the bench to the bedside. Uh, other than diagnostics, I think a very important thing is the therapeutics, especially for a lot of those Mendelian, Mendelian disease. We have strong strong evidence of this genetic uh, this gene is a causal gene and this mutation causing the disease. So now we have the tool to really go there and crack that endogenous gene. That would be the, I think, the fundamental solution of those disease. And should we actually think about identify a list of actionable disease and genes that is really, de 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 is really bad? So when you see this in a, in a small kid, you want to you act on it right away. And will there be a mechanism we can develop to, to a relatively cost-effective model for the therapeutic development? Because each patient most likely is going to be unique. They're going to have different maybe the same gene but different mutation, how do you develop a therapeutic approach that can cure most of the uh, patients? And uh, whether we will have a mechanism to faster approve those therapeutics for some of really devastating disease, uh, I think it's, you know, we have the tools, people are dying, I, I think people should work on it. And, and also, how do we evaluate the, the risk and benefit? Because when you do genome editing, I think nobody can assure there's no off-target whatsoever. Nobody can ever be sure you don't make any other genetic mutation. So if, if it's, um, if, if, if the modified cell is going to be in your body for decades, then there is a chance to develop cancer from it. How do you know it's not from genome editing but from somatic mutation? So I, I, think, I think it's really dependent on the disease and, and, and how, how devastating that is, but this is something to be considered. And uh, even one step further is how do we define the norm of the human genome and what is normal human, what is normal genome, and, and, and where we draw the line to, to make that modification. Is the risk allele is worth editing or not, and, and, and do we go to germline at all? I think that's an interesting question, and it become a reality. I think we people should, have, should think about it. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank a lot of people involved in this for um, really, uh, it's a, a great collaboration within JAX. Um, with the GET group, uh, there are a lot of key people uh, contributed to developing the zinc and improving it, as well as um, the reproductive science group uh, and my lab there. Um, and, and also I have a, a setup in Beijing that uh, I'd like to thank my director there and the uh, fundings. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Once you've picked your job. <laughs>
Dan? Yeah. With this, the, with the first technology, you can overexpress, you can really drive up expression of any gene to sort of massive levels in a, in a so is, is that, is, I don't usually think about increasing gene expression by 20,000 fold, which is what you can do with this technology. I, is that? I, I think that's an artifact because right. it really depends on the basal level of the gene. Right, because it's not if it's zero, then you can infinitely increase it. Right, right. So, right. So the, my question is: Is, is uh, uh, have you been able to think about or see deleterious effects of uh, of that kind of overexpression in in across cell lines or across genes? Um, we we struggle <coughs> we struggle with the idea of you know what would happen if you increase the number of sodium channels in a heart cell, not one fold or two fold, but twenty five fold would that be a bad thing or not, and can a cell would a cell ever do that? I think that's really interesting. I think there's so much unknown there, and also think about the isoforms. We some very interesting thing about when you activate the gene a few hundred fold and the isoform totally gets skewed right and, and there is all unexplored, and I think it's very interesting to to look at um, no answer. But it doesn't like we activate all four um, for hundreds of folding T cells, and that does have uh, activating other genes unrelated. I think it's through the secondary effect. Okay. Bob. Uh, so I have uh, two one, one question, one comment. So the imaging that you did of the, of the nuclei uh, is that an, in an amplified um, target uh, uh, situation, or or could you use that? to visualize the presence or absence of a single nucleotide change? Oh. I mean, could it be a fish for a single nucleotide change? I, I don't think so, because okay. right now what we showed, uh, most of the data are in telomere or centromere. There are still a lot okay. of repeats. And the single, the unique sequence, you still need more than five guide RNA to, to, to tell it. Okay. So I think we're not there yet to, to, to show that type of uh, resolution. Okay. And in terms of um, uh, potential um, catastrophic disease targets, I would suggest IPEX, immuno uh, dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, X-linked, uh, which uh, babies are born with a severe autoimmune disease. Um, there is a treatment, which is bone marrow transplant, but they're often not well enough to get the transplant yeah. initially uh, and have a very um, difficult course initially. And one could think about uh, trying to use this to correct a very small fraction of T cells, which is all that you need right. actually to reverse the autoimmune disease. Yes, we're actually doing a lot of work in the T cells and, and CD34 cells. So yeah, I'll write down the name of the disease after. <laughs> Any other specific questions? 